Hi, I'm Nancy Nangeroni. And I'm Gordine McKenzie. And this is Gender Vision. <laughs> Lots of people making big big bucks. You and me, babe, I see we're out of love. Well, I heard a voice from a high bar. It don't cost a thing just to be in love. We don't have any. Hi, this is Gender Vision, and we are pleased to be back here in 2009 for our second season of programming. Hopefully, we'll do more than eight shows this season. Hopefully, we'll get one out every With month. a new administration. With a new administration. And hope. <laughs> the, this is really the first progressive administration in my lifetime, um, ah. because I don't think Kennedy was progressive. He was liberal. What about Clinton? And, no, I wouldn't have said he was progressive. Maybe. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, we are thrilled. We're thrilled. We're positive looking forward. Um, I'm sure there's good things coming. We're going to get through this economic stuff. And, uh, but you didn't tune in to us to, uh, to hear about Obama. Um, but we do have a few little tidbits for you right at the beginning. Uh, first off, um, the Obama agenda, uh, there's some historic firsts already uh, from the Obama administration. If you go to the whitehouse.gov website, and you click on agenda. The first item is civil rights. And if you click on civil rights, the first item in civil rights, the first bullet point, includes a commitment not just to advocate for, but to pass an uh, employment non-discrimination amendment that would um, make illegal discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And this is uh, the first time a uh, presidential administration has committed to uh, providing protections uh, on the basis of the gender identity, which is um, protecting transgender people like myself, protecting our employment rights. We have upwards of 70% on and under employment, um, and so this is a, a very welcome shift. And it's also welcome for partners and, and families for everyone. Of, of transgender yeah, persons and friends, that. too. And yeah really very, very hopeful. You know, there, there is a lot of good news. Sometimes it looks grim, but, but there's always something that kind of comes through. We have a clip of Gene Robinson, who is the Episcopal minister, openly gay minister, who lives in a same-sex marriage that began some of the inaugural activities at the Lincoln Memorial the day before the actual inauguration. That's right. Um, there, there is a little dispute in terms of when they did the coverage that it was not included on the HBO uh, coverage. But a lot of people thought that might be the antidote to some of Rick Warren's, uh, the anxiety about having Rick Warren who gave the prayer invocation. And Rick Warren had uh, a site that said, we do not allow homosexuals into our ministry. He also had said... A statement, said by the way, that he did, that has he, been he removed. He did remove that. However, he did grant some interviews on right. uh, network television, and he said uh, he equated homosexuals still with pedophilia, with some type of uh, sickness, and yes. he believes that they can be cured. So it was nice to see Gene Robinson, and if you notice in Gene Robinson when he's talking, in his very opening statements, he includes LGBT people, and he says transgender. That's and right. that was at the Lincoln Memorial, so let's go to that. So let's watch this clip. Bless this nation with anger. Anger at discrimination at home and abroad, against refugees and immigrants, women, people of color, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. And we also have good news from Europe. We have a commissioner with the Council of Europe Commission for Human Rights who um, published a viewpoint on, uh, I believe it was January 5th of 2009. And this viewpoint I, uh, says discrimination against transgender persons must no longer be tolerated. And this is a viewpoint that uh, will be um, read throughout the European Union. And this is an important principle that's been stated by the Commission on Human Rights 
and uh, we're very pleased to have this uh, in Europe. It's, a, it's, a, it's some real progress, again, for just the basic civil rights of transgender people. Civil rights and human rights, huge huge jump that this is now the, the language right. that, that we're talking about. Some other good news is uh, GLSEN teamed up with the Ad Council. And GLSEN is the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Educators Network. Yep. And how many of you have ever uh, used the term or heard, it's so gay? Not a complimentary. Heard it. <laughs> yeah. Not, a, not used it, but not a complimentary term. And a lot of people just use it unconsciously. Well, these ads really make you think about it. So kudos to, to GLSEN and the Ad Council for putting these out on network television. Yes, and we have, we, we have one for you here. I, I just love it. I think you will, too. Times, they are a-changing. They are a-changing. So check out this video, this ad. So are you going out tonight? I can't. My parents say I have to be home right after work. <sighs> That's so gay. Totally gay. Ugh, that is so Emma and Julia. Why are you saying that's so Emma and Julia? Well, you know, when something is dumb or stupid, you say that's so Emma and Julia. Who says that? Everyone. Imagine if who you are were used as an insult. When you say that's so gay, do you realize what you say? Knock it off. So we're here on this program to talk about feminism, sexuality, and gender. And, and Gordine, can you kind of uh, lead us into this discussion? Well, there, there's so much to say there, but um, I think one of the things to pay attention to is that our conceptions about sexuality have changed. If we go from the fourth century to the 1700s, historians about, uh, that do work on sexuality noted that female pleasure was taken into account because it didn't think a female could give birth unless she, or procreate, unless she had an orgasm. She couldn't conceive, she couldn't get pregnant. So female pleasure was uh, at one time considered in the debate. And the old model used to see female genitalia and organs just like an inverse of what male genitalia was. So there was kind of uh, an equality and a right to pleasure. Less strict, less strict yeah. differentiation. Yeah, we didn't have, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus and that erroneous stuff and nobody's from Earth, but <laughs> that, that <laughs> takes a while. Uh, we get into the 1700s, from the 1700s uh, through like the 1880s, uh, we look at sex based on procreation. We don't see sex as pleasure and we don't hear a lot about pleasure. In fact, at the end of the 1800s, what we get in Germany, England, and the United States is we get sexologists that start to classify sexuality. By the way, the, the term heterosexual was first used to refer to a perversion. It meant a person who had psychical hermaphroditism, meaning they were attracted to both sexes. And that term came out in the 1890s, so did the term homosexual, and the use of the term homosexual originally referred to what we would think transgender people are, are today. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's really interesting so if you look at the terminology. Time, this was a time when science sort of, and social science, dedicated itself to classifying things, uh, to dividing. But not without morality and values. That science came with values and morality in terms of it said, this is good sexuality, this is abnormal. Heterosexuality rises to the top, and homosexuality or any other type of sexuality or gender becomes aberrant. Men, men who feel themselves to be women, et cetera, that all starts to fall down. And that's our early, early sexology, our ideas. We're still based on a procreation model, so anything that isn't uh, for procreation around sex is bad until we get into like the 1950s, and there are some shifts in the 20s as well. But 1950s, Kinsey studies, begins to look at sex as pleasure and sex in marriage as being, as being very pleasurable. And so, as Gail Rubin says, uh, who's a scholar on sexuality and gender feminist, it's time to start thinking about sex because people can become dangerously crazy about sex. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, people do get dangerously well, crazy about Well, they can, especially sex. in times of severe socioeconomic uh, stresses. People can scapegoat uh, around sexuality and gender. So um, what about feminism then and sexuality? Ah, feminism. Feminism, we, we often think that there's one monolithic idea of a feminist. There isn't. There are cultural feminists, there are uh, 
Marxist feminists, they're progressive feminists, moderate feminists, all kinds of feminists. And uh, when we think about feminism, there are different stages of feminism. The, the feminist movement really came into consciousness in the United States around suffrage and women working for the vote. And many of those women worked with the abolitionists to abolish slavery also. There was a real link there. And then we get another rise in feminism in the late 1960s when mm -hmm. you get the uh, contemporary women's liberation movement. And that begins to critique gender and the way that women and men are treated differently around gender. It grows out of the anti-war movement. Expectations where, and limitations. Yeah, where the women are out there and they're fighting against the war, but at night they go home and it's, hey chick, wash my socks. <laughs> and Or oh my. let's have sex. And what is sex? It's defined by male pleasure. And some, didn't somebody say during the 60s the way that women can contribute to this movement is on their backs? Best be prone. Yeah, yes. Something so like that. The, the attitudes about gender hadn't changed even though people were trying to talk about peace and they were trying to, to figure out things about social, social justice. So then even after the second wave of feminism, we enter into a third wave and some people say a fourth uh, wave where people are thinking about social justice and these are people that grew up sometimes with uh, taking a feminist movement for granted that it had happened and some of their parents are, are feminists. And so yeah. very quickly here, wh what are the primary characteristics of third and fourth then wave? Third and fourth, uh, they- I mean, we, have the, we have the just say no movement at some point, right? Was that second? Well, or? that's chastity. That's, that's a religious, religious oh, right movement. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Movement. The no means no is the one I meant. No means no. That's talking about take back the night, the violence programs that, that characterized a lot of the feminist movement. That wasn't the only, the only focus, but ending violence against women yep. and trying to figure a way to end violence. What's exciting about our guest today is going to talk about uh, the volume she co-edited, uh, Yes Means Yes, also talking about reclaiming a pleasure in sexuality and how that reclamation might, in fact, stop rape. All right. Much more to come. We'll be right back in a minute. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, today we have a wonderful guest with us. We have Jacqueline Friedman, who is a queer Jewish writer, an award-winning poet and performer. She's also the program director for the Center for New Words that books uh, over 50 feminists every year. And she's the co-founder of the Women Action in the Media Conference, which is a very exciting conference that brings women from all over to talk about media from all different levels, print media, electronic media, how women are represented in the media, and more. And she's here today to talk about her brand new book that just came out, and we're, we're very excited, and it's, uh, it's selling very, very well, as it should. And the title of the book is Yes Means Yes, Visions of Female Sexual Power and a World Without Rape. And uh, Jacqueline is the co-editor along with Jessica Valente. Welcome to Gender Vision. Well, so happy doing? to be here. It's great to have you here, Jessica. Very, Jacqueline. very yeah. happy to have you. So, yes means yes mm -hmm. takes the traditional notion that we usually hear, particularly in this era of abstinence education right. and <laughs> other things, of just say no and uh, brings us to a whole different level. Absolutely. Uh, we are, are saying yes to yes, but we are also saying yes to no. One of the things we were really starting from a place um, where we're building on no means no. I mean, a lot of activists worked a lot of decades to make sure that the phrase no means no is That's in right. the public culture and that it's understood that if a person says no to sex, you ought not to continue. Right. <laughs> it's a fairly basic principle. Um, but it's not enough, that's and that's right. where this book comes in. Um, we really firmly believe that if all women have access to is no, if we're supposed to always want to, to say no to sex and we're the gatekeepers of sex, um, we're not supposed to want it for ourselves, you know, we're not supposed to pursue it, God forbid, yeah. um, that we don't have actual bodily autonomy or sexual autonomy if all we have access to is no. Um, and we also further believe that if women had greater access to yeses, that it actually would make rape less frequent and easier to prosecute. So what does it mean to have more access to yeses? 
Well, we're living in a culture that shames and blames women for their sexuality, whichever way you slice it. So on the one hand, you have purity balls and the whole mo abstinence movement and the whole sort of very Puritan belief that women should be abstinent until marriage, that they shouldn't want sex, they shouldn't like sex, we should be pure as the driven snow. And on the other hand, the media is selling us Girls Gone Wild and the Pussycat Dolls uh -huh. and sort of this faux empowerment through sex, which is really all about taking this empty image of women's sexuality and aggressive women's sexuality, packaging it up and selling it back to us as sort of, this is what power looks like, you know, which is not about power for women, it's about making money for men. That's right. Um, <laughs> and sometimes pleasuring men, giving men the access to the gays and all of that. And if it is um, selling power for women, it's selling a sort of secondhand power where you get your power through men. Exactly. By presenting yourself as an object for their consumption. Exactly. And that's still the old model of sex based on men's pleasure and not sex based on women's pleasure in, in sexuality, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And what we're arguing for is a world where we can live in between those two poles, where we can have a sexuality that's about what any individual woman wants. Um, and that may be to dress up in lingerie and you know dance on a stripper pole, but we want to create a culture where that can be a choice um, that can be made free of, of the sort of commercial influence that, you know, you know it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine getting there. <laughs> yes. We'd like to start taking baby steps in that direction yes. anyway. Yeah. And it yeah, may be that that woman wants to say no to sex and wants to not have sex, and that's all. Either either pull is okay. The idea is that women should have access to authentic choices, to be able to access their own authentic sexual expression and not be shamed or blamed for it. Yeah. And not be sold sexuality, as I think you were talking about. I know one of the articles in the book that I, I read talked about like little girls, like preteen oh, girls yeah. being sold uh, padded bras and uh, panties, I can't remember what the they said. The panties said, said, said? Um, who needs credit cards? Right. In the juniors department at Walmart, yeah. That's intense, and poles to, mm -hmm. to dance Stripper on. Poles These are like in little, toy stores. little kids in For toy kids. stores, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's not their decision this at that amazing. point. They're not really making a decision, but they're, they're seeing an image and they're thinking that's what they need to be. And then on the other side of that, what happens is, if a woman does decide to wear a sexy outfit, mm -hmm. go out, party, you know, be a sexual being, sure. and then, God forbid, she's raped, uh, she's not a good victim, right? She's, yeah. We all immediately call her motives into, and her desires into question yeah. because she's not you know, pure as the driven snow, right. um, and therefore she must have wanted it or asked for it. And that puts it all on the woman. And one of the things that I thought the book did really well was it said, why aren't we talking to the men that rape or assault? Why do we keep telling women to modify their behavior? You know, shouldn't, shouldn't sex education really talk about pleasure and also that you don't violate other people? You know, can we be more progressive? Absolutely. You know, we talk a lot, you hear a lot of talk about drinking and rape, and usually the message is women be careful, don't go out and get drunk in public mm -hmm. because you might get yourself raped. Well, That's right. Every rapist has a very key component. Every rape has a key component. I, I gave away my punchline. Every <laughs> rape has a key component, and that's the rapist. Yes. <laughs> a good yes. point. Um, good you point. know, and that falls out of even the syntax of that sentence, right? Women, yeah. don't be careful. You're, you'll get raped. Yep. Yeah. Right. We don't. There's no rapist in that sentence. And when we look at the statistics around drinking and rape, we see that men are actually more likely to rape while drunk than women are to be raped while drunk. Right. But you never hear that statistic. Yeah. Interesting. You never, hear, you no never hear the message that says, men, be careful, don't go out and get too drunk, you might rape someone. Yes. When have we ever heard that message? What a, and what a wonderful message that would be to hear. That's a revelation. Yes. Yeah. That, but in powerful. a country that doesn't have sex education other than chastity programs mm -hmm. or just say no, which started during the Reagan era. But that's then, changing now. Yeah. That is changing. But there's the a lot of work that needs to be changing. done. But yeah, Obama said sex education yeah. is going to change, which is I exciting. I haven't heard yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, things are going to change that Well, here's way. a man who actually is, appears to be sexually attracted to his wife, so that's and a... Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it wonderful to see an obviously successful relationship, not not one that's just sort of pro forma for the cameras, mm -hmm. you know, but where they actually play together publicly yeah. and their children play with them publicly, 
You know, it, that, that's where you see the real truth of the relationship. It's so wonderful because there's so much, there's so little relationship positive things that I see out there. Yeah. You know, there's, there's soap operas and that sort of stuff. But No, you can tell they actually dig each other in a very real world kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, I'd well, like I can that. see why. Yeah, well, sure. <laughs> so we're changing, and we're changing images, and yeah. that, that's really exciting too. And a, another thing that, that Michelle Obama is doing, and, and people have talked about as well, is she's not fitting that stereotypical body, which is yeah. really refreshing. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's nice it's to see. Real say. woman. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, there's an essay in the book, in Yes Means Yes, um, called Queering Black Female Heterosexuality yes. by Kimberly Springer. Um, and her proposal is that black women in particular have been stuck in one of two roles. They either get to be the Jezebel, you know, the oversexed, you know, hot woman of color, or um, they get to be the, the sort of sexless mammy, or in, yeah, in she Martin, sort of yeah. updates mm. that as to think about the black lady, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oprah, you know. The hat woman. Right. The, <laughs> the hat church woman. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that Michelle Obama actually, I think, is good. And, and her proposal is to sort of take a page out of Queer's uh, civil rights movement and say black women need to come out about their own sexualities, about their own sexual lives. It's a really right. powerful essay. Um, and I think Michelle Obama actually is a role model about that. I think that. so, She too. is clearly in possession of her body and her sexuality. She, you know, and she's not, she's not the, the sexless black lady. She's certainly not the Jezebel. Um, she's just a person. Yeah, you I, know? Love, I love yeah, the way she comports herself, the way she dresses. I don't always think her fashions are the sexiest or the most stylish. But I do think... Oh, but think about the pressure she's under choosing yeah. every outfit. But, yeah. Yeah. But, but I don't think it's... You know, it's. It, I don't think it's really her role to be this. You know, sexiest woman in America. Her role is to be the most um, accomplished, the most fulfilled woman in America. And I think she does that really well. And I think her outfits show that because her outfits show an independent mind. Yes, it's, it's interesting how the media had a feeding frenzy though right away in terms of what she's signifying for fashion, and we just launched into this whole thing. Well, of we course, forgot about she's an accomplished attorney. Yeah. Oh my She gosh. was actually Obama's supervisor yes. at one point. Oh, is one that right? Point. That's oh, how they met. Oh, yeah, that's how she they met. She was his yeah. mentor at a law yeah. firm. No kidding. But she yeah. wouldn't date him until they they weren't uh, working Good for together. Her. Anymore. Good for her. So I mean, we Good it was both. interesting how all of a sudden the fashion kind of swept all that away, and you know, like. So she was only going to set a fashion tone. Well, and that gets back to sort of what we're talking about in Yes Means Yes, which is that women's bodies are seen really as commodities in Absolutely. our culture, right? Yeah. So that's okay. We have this powerful one. We need to figure out a way to sell things with this. <laughs> Otherwise, it's too threatening out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that when you have that commodity model, that really it, it hangs over into the way we talk about sex, right? The way we currently talk about sex in our culture is this very heterosexist, that's right. model in which women have the sex <laughs> and men wa want the sex and are told that in order to be That's good right. men they must get the sex at yeah. all costs they must do whatever it takes to get the sex That's from right. the women yeah. and it it's literally becomes this thing right this th this transaction and and that's where the purity stuff comes in. Women are told to make the best trade they can yeah. for their precious commodity, which will devalue after the first pressing, you know, yeah. like, yes. like extra that's virgin right. olive oil. That's right. Um, that's right. I'm yeah. stealing heavily from one of the essays in the book by Thomas Miller, yeah, by that, the way. But meanwhile, our gaze is, is narrowed further and further right. to a very small part of her anatomy. And what if we flipped that on its head and thought about sex as a collaborative performance between two or more people. Isn't that important? Think about jazz, right? So think about musicians. Oh, how lovely. I know, right. Mm -hmm. Would you ever go up to a musician and try to coerce them into playing with you? If you, if you mm -hmm. took someone and forced them some, against their will to jam with you, it would be kidnapping. Yeah. Right? And it wouldn't be good music, it no, would, no. Right. It would, yeah. and it, you could call it music, but that's not what the, tr the interaction would be that's, about. That's right. That's, um, a, that's a great analogy. Um, again, I'm stealing. It's not mine. It's in the book. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, it really, we need a profound shift in this culture. Our attitudes about sex and gender are profoundly diseased. Um, and what we're calling for in the book, in Yes Means Yes, is to start over with a new model and new visions. Wonderful. That's how does really how do we, you know, what's our? We, we just have a few minutes left. Sure. What? But what's our first step? You know, what would what would you tell people is our first step to lead us out of this kind of very twisted place? Well, I think real sex education is a key part. If we can get that happening in our schools, that's going to go a long way. If we can have sex education that only 
that not only doesn't shame girls for having sexuality or tells them that their job is to say no at all times and tells boys that their job is to be the aggressor. And equating purity right. with this sort of non-performance. But to replace all those lessons with one that says, your body can actually bring you pleasure and That's there's right. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. If you are emotionally ready, if you take the proper safety precautions, you know, in context, your body can be great and pleasurable. And yeah. it's consensual, and if it's consensual, and you also take into account the other person's desires. Right. Real key point. Not yeah. just a lack of no, but yeah. an enthusiastic yes. Yes. Yeah. Because we get, we hear from these, you know, the men who want to say, well, what if I do X, and what if she's only had X amount to drink? Is it okay? You know. I know. And it, my message to those folks is to say, like, how sorry for you that you don't think you can get someone who's actually willing and psyched about having sex with you. Well, yeah. Like, what yeah. if we all just slept with people who were really excited about having sex That's with right. us? There's a lot of guys out there that really struggle with that, who, who really struggle with finding a partner, who, who are despair of any hope of finding a partner. So that, too, is part of the problem, I think. When you have a, when you have a whole class of men, and a lot of the beer commercials kind of mm -hmm. trumpet and, 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 and put men into this place where they sort of acknowledge they're never going to get a beautiful woman. And so, you know, they, there's this whole mindset of kind of being a loser when it comes to love and sex. And, and, and that idea of what a beautiful woman is, too. Well, well and that's, where, that's yeah. a hard trap <laughs> for men yeah. as well. I mean, this hurts men as well. I won't say Fair equally, enough. but it, this trap, this disease of our sexual culture hurts men as well. Because Absolutely. what if we didn't have that idea of every man needs to be sleeping with the supermodel, you know? which is ridiculous. We can't all do that. We have to wrap. Okay. We're just about out of time, but I do want to make sure we tell people about, um, we told them about your book. Yes. And Center for New Words. Centerfornewwords.org. Center for New Words. Do you have a website, Jacqueline? I'm at JacquelineFreeman.com, yes. Excellent. Okay, and we'll, we'll post okay, that. Okay, we'll put it up. Yeah. All right. Um, any last words? Uh, buy the book. <laughs> All right. It's a great book with a lot of uh, inspiring writing from a, from a great variety of authors. And great. And it shifts our vision to a more collaborative vision and to a more pleasurable vision. All right. It's time for that. And our vision can always use a little bit more shifting. And stretching. That's right. <laughs> so stretch your gender vision. And we'll see you next time. We'll have more with Jacqueline um, to come. And uh, we'll see you next time. So thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for watching. Thank you.